This is Velocity from Vapotherm. Each episode, we join conversations among clinical peers from throughout the country and throughout the hospital. Today's episode is an emotional one. Dr. Lou Rotkowitz is an ER physician out of Queens, New York. Dr. Rotkowitz, like so many other healthcare providers, was hit hard by COVID-19. His symptoms began at a time when clinical practice was shifting to increase use of high-velocity therapy and high-flow devices in an effort to curb intubation. In this first of a two-part series, we join Dr. Rotkowitz in conversations with our own Director of Emergency Department Education and fellow ER physician, Dr. Kirk Hinckley. Vapotherm High Velocity Therapy is a tool for treating respiratory distress. Vapotherm does not practice medicine, provide medical services, or offer medical advice. Any recommendations in today's episode are solely those of the speakers. Refer to instructions for use for any products mentioned in this episode. Now, let's join Dr. Hinckley and Dr. Rotkowitz. Um, my name is Lou Rotkowitz. I'm, a, uh, I'm an emergency room physician practicing in New York City. Uh, particularly Queens, Queens, New York City. Uh, I went to medical school overseas, uh, worked uh, in a third world country in Belize, Central America, and then did my clinical rotations uh, over in uh, the United Kingdom for a year. Um, I came back home, passed my boards. Um, I did a year of general surgery at Nassau County Medical Center. Um, and, that's, and that's actually where I first... Uh, saw them using Vapotherm in our surgical, uh, surgical ICU. After that, can't really remember seeing Vapotherm ever again in my career. Uh, I did a family medicine residency up in Albany. Um, but uh, after doing the surgical critical care stuff, uh, I really, my, my passion was emergency medicine. Um, worked up in the Adirondacks for a while, and then eventually, within a year or two, made my way back to New York City, where for the past 10 years, I've been working in like various uh, community emergency rooms in New York City. Uh, I guess everything would lead me to this uh, coronavirus out outbreak, which uh, essentially for me started in mid to late February. Um, in my emergency room, I saw one of the first patients um, who actually really wasn't a patient. But after that, uh, everything just sort of went into full throttle. Um, you know, we were wearing our personal protective equipment, uh, N95s, um, and, you know, it was just, we were just mobbed with patients. Um, I guess fast forward now to late March, um, I was working in an area of the emergency room called the hot zone, and that's when I believe I was exposed to, uh, COVID-19. I mean, I had been exposed for the past month you know, month or month or two working through the uh, the thicket of everything, but I I'm pretty certain uh, where I contracted it, and it was uh, doing an intubation. Um, and actually, that that night was very challenging. We had six six or seven intubations, and I, I think we've talked about this story. But so you've had you had multiple intubations to perform. Yeah, I performed multiple intubations. Um, Towards consecutively, of, consecutively uh, towards the end of March. Okay. Uh, and, and I mainly work the overnight shifts. Um, did another overnight shift about three days later, and at about four or five o'clock in the morning, started to feel like really weak. Uh, that was towards the end of March, the tail end of March. Um, started coughing and, and, uh, just didn't look well. And one of the PAs that I work with uh, said, hey, are you okay? I hope this isn't what we think it is. Went home and by that evening I had uh, fevers, chills, sweating, just feeling horrible. Um, on the morning of April 1st, woke up and uh, could, could barely stand up. I was having trouble like mentating, uh, was sweating profusely. Um, almost delirious. Um, I was going into the, I, I, I called my boss in the hospital and they told me to come into employee health to get, you know, to, uh, to get swabbed. Um, I didn't want to go in looking horrible. So 
uh, you know, showered, shaved, and then I took out some aftershave that's, uh, that has a very strong lemony smell to it. It's called Limacol. I put that up to my nose, um, and I'm like, what's, there's something very wrong here. I couldn't smell anything. And, uh, you know, that's something that you could, you could wake up a dead person with. It's so tardy. But, uh, you know, I started to get really, really concerned at that point. Um, went over to the emergency room. Uh, <clears throat> they sent me over to employee health uh, where they, you know, they looked at me. They go, what, what happened? They were like, people have never seen me so sick looking before. Um, you know, I'm a, usually like a really upbeat guy. I have like four or five jobs. I'm always bouncing around. And now here I was brought down to my knees. Um, so they sent me home. Um, some concerned friends called me. They said, you got to get your hands on some Plaquenil and Zithromax. And then uh, I was able to start Plaquenil, Zithromax, vitamin C, and zinc. Uh, life went on for about uh, a total of another seven days. Uh, everything brought me, I, I, I would say, to like um, April 8th. April 8th, I woke up, I was really short of breath. Um, I would, I mean, one of the things most stressful for me is like, I live in a co-op. Uh, so you have to take your, you have to walk your garbage to the, you know, out of the house to the, the back of the co-op. And I, I honestly, like, I couldn't do it. Like I, I, I was about to collapse doing that at that point. Like I knew, uh, I knew I, I, I knew I was in trouble. Um, Checked my oxygen saturation levels, and they were, you know, they were starting to fall into the 80s. Reached out to some friends from the Hatzola ambulance, and they brought me some, they brought me an oxygen condenser, just, you know, out of the blue. I, I just don't know how that appeared, but they were able to get that for me. Um, they put me on, you know, I, they, they, you know, they put me on some nasal cannula oxygen through the condenser. But uh, I think I was just starting to get worse. Um, by the afternoon, a, a friend had come over. Uh, he's a nurse, and he's also a New York City police lieutenant. He came to check on me. Um, and by then, my oxygen saturation level had fallen to 78. Uh, he, he couldn't believe it. He pulled, the, he pulled the probe off my finger, put it on his finger, and it was 98. Um, so it was real. I reached out to a friend who's an, uh, an attending critical care physician at NYU at NYU Lutheran uh, in Brooklyn. And uh, he told me that I, I, at that point I would, I had to go to the hospital. He said it would have been too dangerous. He said if it would have gotten, sorry. Okay. Take your time. The concern that we had was uh, that I was going to stop breathing. It's, it's difficult, you know. You know, you're the physician. You have all the knowledge. You know what's going on. You know what to tell your patients. But when the tables are turned, it's, uh, it's difficult, you know, for yourself to do the right thing. Um, so at that point, uh, I gathered some things together, <laughs> an iPhone charger, which is probably the most important thing in the world. And, uh, I put some things together and, uh, uh my friend took me, uh, took me to NYU medical center on first Avenue in Manhattan. Um, I was so fearful of, uh, you know, what things would look like, you know, when I got to the hospital, would it be chaotic, you know, where it was, where I worked, but um, they really, over at that hospital, they really had like a lid on things, they had really great control of everything, and they, uh, you know, they, they immediately brought me in, I mean, there was no, they, they didn't waste time at all, I guess I, I guess I was really looking that sick. Um... They took me into the emergency room. Uh, they checked my oxygen saturation levels. Again, 
still in the high 70s, probably, I think it was 78 again. They got me on some non-rebreather oxygen and uh, they checked some blood. But I, I think even before, if I recall, even before that they, they checked blood, they, uh, they brought out the Vapotherm machine immediately. And um, there was a respiratory therapist that um, came and came and started me on it even before they, they did my chest x-ray. Um, I guess they knew what was going on. Uh, when they strapped you to the Vapotherm, describe what it was like within the first few minutes. I, I immediately, it was almost a feeling of being high. I immediately felt better. Um, I guess it was because I was starting to get uh, oxygen to my brain and, and, and into my body. Uh, the, only thing, the, the only way I can describe it is I, I felt as if I was standing in front of like, a, like an F-16 fighter jet just from the, uh, the intensity of the flow of oxygen that was coming into my nose. But um, I immediately felt better uh, because I, had, I, I assume I had been without, you know, my oxygen levels were, were really low for quite some time. Um, you know, they, they had me on that for a few moments and I kind of settled down. I just felt a lot more calmer. And then uh, they placed an IV line. They took a whole bunch of bloods. Um, and uh, they did a chest x-ray. Um, I've shown you the chest x-ray. It's just, uh, it's terrible. Terrible to look at the chest x-ray, you know, to see how, uh, you know, to see how violently this thing attacked. Um, so they had me on, they told, I, they, they told me that they had me on like the highest settings. It was 40 liters. It was, it was a hundred percent of oxygen and it was, it said 35 degrees Celsius. Um, they took me up to, uh, I think it was like a step down type of setting. Uh, it was in the Kimmel area of the hospital. So they had turned all the rooms into essentially critical care rooms. Um, they took me up pretty quickly, but uh, you know, immediately I was I was feeling better. I'm like, okay, I'm 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 okay. Uh, the first attending that had come around, like I think it was this this is like now hospital day one. Hospital day zero would be when I I guess when I walked in, but on hospital day one, I I I said to the attending, you know, uh, hey, am I going to be okay? Do you think I'm I'm going to need to be intubated. And, uh, you know, that's got a little concern when he said to me, you know, there still is a chance. Um, but uh, let's keep you on the Vapotherm and start some other medications. I, I just, uh, sorry, I'm getting upset, but it was. Uh, it's well, very listen, I think the, I think the toll on the whole person and the mental health impact is important as well. We haven't talked a lot about that and right. you haven't read about that. And, you know, to, to experience your own mortality or to, to, to contemplate that is, is part of the story. Right. I was up there for, uh, I was up there at NYU. Um, the hospital stay was a total of 10 days. Um, they restarted me back on on uh, <clears throat> on Zithromax and Plaquenil. Um, they gave me Crestor, which is you know the the cholesterol drug, mm -hmm. um, which has anti-inflammatory uh, properties to it. Um, they started me on an HIV drug called Calitra. Um, I as I guess as we approached hospital day one. A, a woman came to my, to my bedside. She was a, um, a renal transplant fellow. And she told me, she asked me if I wanted to be part of a, of a clinical trial uh, where they gave me a medicine that uh, there, were, there were three options, a control, half a dose, and a full dose of an IL-6 blocker. I'm sorry, I just can't remember the name of it, but... Um, you know, it was one. It was a one-time dose. She told me that. Um, uh, she told me that she had given this medicine 
to an OBGYN uh, surgeon that was there a couple of days ago. And then two, three days later, he just got up and walked out of the hospital. I, I started to plead with her to just forget the clinical trial and just give me the medication. But uh, she just, she sort of, um, you know, I could see, I could see she was like upset, you know, but she had to do what she had to do. And uh, I'm not entirely sure if I, if I did get it, I think, honest to God, at the end of the day, I, 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 I'm, I'm certain the thing that helped me the most was just getting air into my body, just allowing my body to oxygenate, get blood to my brain, my lungs, and I think my body did all the work. And that's because of the vapor therm machine. I, I know it in my heart. I know physiology, I know pathology, I know pharmacology better than anybody, but that's what I needed. But uh, so I mentioned that they put me on the Kaletra. Um, I asked them if they could give me some magnesium to help relax my, my lungs. Um, and they also put me on some uh, steroids, uh, intravenous steroids, like a five-day course. Um, I think by hospital day seven, well, I guess hospital day five, they were, they were slowly starting to titrate the vapotherm down, uh, maybe even sooner. And uh, essentially by hospital day seven, I was off the vapotherm and now on like non-rebreather and then on um, nasal cannula oxygen. Um, by hospital day nine, they transferred me to uh, Tisch Hospital, which is like, like much less acute and, um, you know, I was on nasal, nasal cannula oxygen. Um, I really did. I really needed it because I was standing by the end of the hospital day course, but by, by the end of the hospital course, I was still standing in the low nineties. I, I'm not going to fool anybody. Um, and I went home on a condenser, uh, by hospital day 10 and the same guy that, uh, took me to the hospital. He, he came and pick me up. I, I have, you know, it's, the whole experience shows you who your true friends are through the entire thing. So let me ask you this yeah. so er, early, say mid March. I know you probably started to see patients in early March. Yes. Uh, you no know, uh, Queens and in, in, in the part of New York that you work is kind of ground zero, if you will. Yeah. And you experienced some of the first cases or at least a first surge of cases. Yeah. How fortunate do you feel that you were that you exhibited symptoms in early April rather than mid-March? So there is a paradigm shift in the way that we treated this disease. I know. I know. That happened. That, that's I'm, the, I'm just going to help you. No, no. I, I, it's just very difficult for me to say. I, you don't even oh, yeah. say anything. I, let me just, this is very important. And, and people need to hear this because, okay, let me, this is really important, really important. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm really so sorry. I'm biting my lip, Lou, myself <laughs> to try to not water out my glasses. No, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm doing good. I'm finishing my paper. I, I'm going to get my MPH. I'm so happy. Uh, had this, had I become symptomatic in, in early, mid-March, had I gotten as sick as I did, without question, um, I can say with, with the most certainty, I would have been intubated. And, and, and that was my biggest fear. That was my biggest fear uh, when I was at NYU. That was my biggest fear about getting sick. I knew I was going to get sick. Um, I was in the thicket of it. I was, you know, the, the, the level of viral low that we were exposed to was so high, but I knew, I knew I was going to get sick, but I never envisioned that I would get this sick. But had, had this happened to me, um, in March, I, I can say with certainty, I would have been, been intubated and, and it would have been very unlikely just unlikely knowing me that I would have made it off the ventilator. 
So in many regards, I'm, I'm very fortunate that this happened, that I held on and it happened in early April. I'm very fortunate that I went to NYU um, where, they, where they have vapotherm technology. Everything just went right. I'm just very fortunate for the people over at NYU. They, they were very good to me. Um, they gave me like the highest level of care that I could have gotten. Uh, I know it sounds crazy, but um, I wanted to figure out a way to thank everybody. So as I was, you know, as I was leaving the room, hospital day nine, while they were transferring me to the uh, step down unit, started taking pictures of my bed in the room. I started taking pictures of like just, you know, the windows and I wanted to take a picture of the, uh, of the machine, the Vapotherm machine. And I went over there because, because I'm a curious person and uh, took a picture of the serial number. And uh, I wanted to, to thank the person who made the machine that saved my life. Uh, during the hospital stay, I, uh, I reached out to, um, there was a lot, of, I've been very blessed. There's been a lot of people that have been reaching out to me, checking up on me. People kind of snuck in that weren't supposed to sneak in, but they just were really concerned about me. But I had reached out to, uh, to Dr. Richard Levitin, who's an airway specialist. And um, I guess after... Um, after residency and as I became more serious about working in the emergency room, wanted to improve my ability to intubate. So I looked around and I, I said, who's, you know, where's the best course to learn how to intubate? So I went down to shock trauma and that's where I met Rich, Rich Levitin. And, uh, you know, he's the, the king of intubation. <laughs> like that's all he talks about intubating, intubating, intubating. And now, all of a sudden, Dr. Levitin is telling, you know, saying, don't intubate. So I, I had reached out to him. I sent him my chest x-ray, and, and within a few minutes, he called me back. I ran my case by him, and uh, he was, you know, he was just saying how, you know, he was saying, you know, the world needs to know that intubation is not the answer for this, you know, and it, it's using you know, technologies like Vapotherm, you know, and I was like living proof that it worked. Um, they also came in one night and uh, they, they flipped me around and put me on my belly. I thought that the orthopedic residents were going to be coming around to prone me, but it was actually the physical therapists and they came around late one night. But by the time they had come around, I, I was already getting better. I was like mentating better. I was able to communicate with people like psychologically, I was like, you know, a bit, you know, rattled, but, you know, overall I was just getting, I was better, you know, I was able to get up, you know, they put a, you know, move around in the room, go in, go in and uh, do things that, you know, you would normally want to do like play on my iPad, things like that. But, uh, Again, by the time they had reached me, I was already getting better. They were already titrating me down off the vapotherm. I can't stress to you enough, when I had gotten into the hospital, they, they put vapotherm on me. And uh, I guess for the first time in like eight days, it was the first time in eight days where I was like able to like think and just uh, there was like this sense of euphoria the emergency room doctor came in and she said, how are you doing? And I, and I said to her, I said, I feel great. And I, I had, I still had a temperature of like 103. She laughed, but uh, I told her I feel great. I just felt like I was kind of in front of Niagara Falls with all the uh, ox, the, the air, like just flowing up in, into inside my nose. I just felt it getting inside of me. Um, I'm not crazy. I'm just telling you like how I like was feeling physically. What do you know about some of your, you told, you talked about the chest x-ray. What do you know about some of your laboratory findings? They sent out a number of uh, acute phase reactants, things like ferritin, CRP, D-dimer, 
Um, I'm sorry. I'm ER doctor. My brother's an oncologist, so I was, you know, I was able to use this NYU my chart and confer with him about everything that was going on. But the D dimer was a little elevated. Uh, all the acute phase reactants were elevated, like the ferritin level, um, the CRP. Uh, liver, my, my kidney function was okay, thank God. I know a lot of people had, had gone into kidney failure, but I was very fortunate. Um, they were checking labs nearly every day, and those acute phase reactants started to, uh, they just started to trend downward. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Velocity from Vapotherm. New episodes are published regularly to YouTube, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you choose to listen to podcasts. And wherever that is, please be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Are you looking for more information on Vapotherm High Velocity Therapy? Learn more at www.vapotherm.com. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you next time.